Hi, welcome back to the Walk Wandering Wesleyan. Uh, this is Chaplain Greg, and uh, Walking in the Word series. We're continuing with the Major Prophets and continuing with Isaiah. And we were talking last uh, last week about chapters one through thirty-nine, and how they uh, really spelled out doom and gloom for for uh, Israel, for uh, Judea, Jerusalem, and how Assyria and Babylon were going to be uh, destroying them and sending them into exile. And uh, then we come to chapters 40 through 66 of Isaiah, and written by followers of Isaiah's prophecies, probably during the exile and then after, and then during Ezra and Nehemiah's time. And, um, the concept of Messiah that was started in chapters 1 through 39, uh, really, really in chapters 7, 9, and 11, is more fully explored. Chapters 41 through 48 explains why the exile happened. Why did this have to happen? But then we get to chapters 49 through 55, and we get a lot of talk about the Anointed One, the Meshiach, or the Messiah. And I want to read a couple of passages for you because these are really important chapters for understanding who the Messiah was going to be. And unfortunately, the, the scholars of Jesus' time didn't see it in Jesus. They didn't see this as being the Messiah. They thought God was talking about them in these in these verses, but no, he was talking about his anointed one. And when you start in Isaiah 53, 1 through 10, it says, Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom was the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. <clears throat> he was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Yet he bore, him, bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion and crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him and we were healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned our own way. and The Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb. He was led to slaughter. Remember, lambs were used for purification as part of the uh, sacrifice system. He was like a lamb. He was led to slaughter like a sheep, silent before the shearers. He did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned and gave and grave with the wicked. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man at his death because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days, and by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. <clears throat> this is the suffering servant. This is Jesus. Um, I don't think there is a plainer prophetic word written hundreds of years before Jesus arrived, um, pointing exactly to what Jesus, who Jesus was and what he went through. But then it picks up in verse 11. And this is worth reading. After his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteousness, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the many as portion, and he will receive 
the mighty as spoil, because he willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels. Yet he bore the sins of many and interceded for the rebels. This is talking about the resurrection and the atonement that Jesus provides on the cross. Chapters 56 through 66 talk about the servants who follow Messiah and inherit God's kingdom. And as you're reading through Isaiah, remember these sections. It helps you to have the context of what you're reading about so that you can get the full worth out of it. Isaiah 53 makes no sense unless you've read chapters 1 through 39 and the rebelliousness and the sin that has happened and the sacrifice that's needed. Isaiah is in a very, very important book to Jews and to Christians, and it's worth reading and rereading over and over again. Now, the next prophet we're going to come to is the prophet Jeremiah, and we have his prophetic book, but we also have uh, Lamentations as well. Lamentations was written by Jeremiah and is a series of regrets. So is it a happy book? Not even close. But again, it's why we listen to blues music or sad songs. It's because it speaks to a certain part of us that feels sadness, that feels regret. So Jeremiah prophesied during Jehoash, Jehoaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoi Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. So what does that tell you? That tells you that Jeremiah was there at the end when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and took over Jerusalem. Jeremiah was there. He was a prophet during the fall. Israel had broken the covenant repeatedly and horribly. And we learned about that when we talked about history. And the fall of Jerusalem is a done deal. See, while he's prophesying before it actually happens, nobody believes it. This is Jerusalem. We are impenetrable. Nobody can destroy us. Well, Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord reached out his hand, touched my mouth, and told me, I have now filled your mouth with my words. See, I have appointed you today over nations and kingdoms to uproot, to tear down, to destroy and demolish, to build and plant. That's pretty straightforward. Jeremiah is called to prophesy doom and gloom. That's why he's frequently called the weeping prophet, because just over and over again, he's telling uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and the nations surrounding them. Remember, there's a number of nations surrounding them. Remember the Philistines? Yeah. Remember the Moabites? Yeah. All of these folks are going to be destroyed by Babylon as well. Everybody's coming under judgment. He also prophesied against all of Israel's hostile natures, as I said. So, judgment against Jerusalem, that's, ver that's chapters 26 through 45. Judgment against other nations, that's chapters 46 through 51. People are called to surrender to the Babylonians in order to survive. To run away would be a grave mistake. So, we're going to look at Jeremiah 38 real quick. All right. And verses 17 and 18. Jeremiah therefore said to Zedekiah, This is what the Lord, the God of armies, the God of Israel says. If indeed you surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then you will live. The city will not be burned, and you and your household will survive. But if you do not surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then the city will be handed over to the Chaldeans. That's the Babylonians. They will burn it and you yourself will not escape them. Pretty clear, right? You think Zedekiah did that? Nope, he didn't. But there were a number of people who did, and there were a number of people who were taken captive and sent into exile. Daniel and his friends, for example. Um, so, chapter 52 is taken from 2 Kings 25 and is really 
talking about how well, let, let's go there real quick and just get the chapter 52 and it talks about the destruction of Jerusalem in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign on the tenth day of the tenth month King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon advanced against Jerusalem with his entire army they laid siege siege to the city and built a siege wall against it all around the city was under siege until Zedekiah's 11th year. And what happened in Zedekiah's 11th year? <laughs> yeah, bad news. So um, that's that. Lamentations, probably written by Jeremiah, maybe his followers. And it's a poetic reflection on the fall of Jerusalem and the exile. Think about all the sad songs that we've heard in our lives. Um, you remember that old 70s hit? It was a one-hit wonder called Seasons in the Sun about a guy who's dying and all his regrets. That's kind of what Lamentations is. It's just in poetic form putting out how regretful he is that his nation abandoned God and brought this on themselves. See, judgment comes because... We've abandoned God, not because God abandoned us. It doesn't mean that bad things happen to us because we abandon God, but judgment comes. That moves us to Ezekiel. Uh, I covered a lot of ground with Jeremiah, so, but a, a lot of it is the repet is repetition of these prophecies against Jerusalem, against the kings, and against the neighbors of Jerusalem saying that Babylon is going to destroy them, and it does. Ezekiel, on the other hand, was written in Babylon after the first wave of exiles were deported. So Ezekiel was kind of a contemporary of Daniel. It was started before the temple was destroyed, and he was a contemporary of Jeremiah and Daniel, but he prophesied for different reasons and using different methods. And he had some pretty weird methods. Yahweh left the temple. And now Ezekiel saw the kavod, or the glory of Yahweh, before him in his vision, but it was no longer in the temple. Chapters 1 through 11 are all the accusations against Israel. He used some strange acts to convey this message. So, in one act... He, lay, he laid on his side for over a year. Ugh. I have a tough time laying on my side for an hour when I'm sleeping at night. Um, he built a miniature replica of Jerusalem and destroyed it. He chopped his hair with a sword, and there was a, there's a number of others. He did some really weird stuff as object lessons to display this is what is happening. The main message is this. Israel was in a state of grave sin. Babylon is going to destroy the temple. Jerusalem will ignore all of these warnings. And God finishes what he promises. So let's go to chapter 11. So in Ezekiel 11, verses 18 through 21, God talks about the return and how the people will return from exile and he says when they arrive there they will remove all its abhorrent acts and detestable practices from it meaning jerusalem and the temple i will give them integrity of heart i will put a new spirit within them i will remove their heart of stone from their bodies and give them a heart of flesh so that they will follow my statutes keep my ordinances and practice them they will be my people i will be their god but as for those whose hearts pursue their desire for abhorrent acts and detestable practices, I will bring their conduct down on their own heads. This is the declaration of the Lord. God finishes what he promises. He will finish his judgment, but he promises that there will be restoration. Now chapters 12 through 32, we talk about judgment. 12 through 24 is judgment against Israel. 25 through 32 is judgment against all the surrounding nations. We heard that from Jeremiah. 
The judgment against other nations like Isaiah and Jeremiah reflects how all of God, all the members of God's family. So remember Ham, Ishmael, and Esau, remember those guys? They went astray, worshiped other gods, and their families are these surrounding nations. In chapter 33, we talk about the temple being destroyed. And again, like with Isaiah, if it ended at chapter 39, we'd have a very dark book, but it doesn't end there because chapters 34 through 37 of Ezekiel talk about hope for Israel. It resumes the concept of Messiah that started with Isaiah. Uh, chapter 37, read chapter 37. If you do anything this week, read chapter 37 of Ezekiel, the Valley of Dry Bones. Recall Genesis chapter two, when the human is split into two, when the human is created from dust. But it's also looking towards a new creation. Chapters 38 through 39 is the hope for the nations. John in Revelation picks up a lot of this imagery. If you're going to read Revelation, you better read Daniel, you better read Isaiah, you better read Ezekiel. Because John pulls a lot of imagery from those three prophets. 38 through to 39, hope for the nations. 40 through 48, hope for all creation, a new temple. Revelation 21 and 22, a new creation. This brings us finally to Daniel. And I'm going to finish up with Daniel here. Daniel is a contemporary of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. The destruction of the temple isn't mentioned in the book. It's kind of a given. There's different languages. There's Hebrew and Aramaic. So chapter 1 is in Hebrew. Chapters 2 through 7 is in Aramaic. Chapters 8 through 12 is in Hebrew. And this is why Daniel is not put into the prophet's in, in the Jewish Bible, in our Jewish friend's Bible, but is put in the writings. It tells the story of what it's like to be faithful and Jewish while being exiled. So uh, chapter one is about keeping kosher, eating correctly, staying faithful to Yahweh. The three friends in the furnace in chapter three, not bowing down to other gods, Daniel in the lion's den, again, not bowing down to other gods. Daniel discovers his prophetic call, and he explains the king's dreams in chapters 2 and 4. They're not always good messages that he's bringing to the king, but he's being faithful in describing these dreams to the king. The vision of the writing on the wall in chapter 5 and the dream of the four beasts in chapter 7. John uses this imagery for chapter 17 and 19. And the dreams of chapter 8 are looking towards the Greek Empire and Alexander the Great. All of this is happening while in exile. He's visited by an angel in chapter 9. Israel is still sinning. Exile and domination from other nations will continue for 490 years. Jeremiah said 70, but the angel said it's going to be seven times that. And that brings us to the Roman Empire and Jesus. His third vision in chapters 10 through 12. So it's the same kings as the prior dream, but this time the great king of the north. He establishes himself in the temple, calls himself God, and des desecrates the temple. This is what the Syrian Greek conqueror Antiochus did, and what the Roman Empire did in AD 70. It's, dedic it's, it's talking about the future destruction and the future desecration of the temple. Um, it's talking about a lot of different things. And some people say it's only about 8070. It's only about Antiochus. It's only about a future desecration. It, he's talking about all of them. So what's the point of Daniel? Humans and their kingdoms become sneaky. They become beasts, snakes, dragons, when they abandon and ignore God. And God will confront and overcome the beasts and the snakes and the dragons. God is an overcoming God. He doesn't leave his people 
who are faithfully worshiping him. And that's the point of Daniel. And we've taken a big step through the major prophets. And where do we go from here? Well, the minor prophets, a whole bunch of prophets, finishing up the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. So next week, the minor prophets. But until then, this is Chaplain Greg. If you uh, enjoyed this video, please like, please subscribe. Uh, put a comment below, share. Uh, happy to hear from you. WanderingWesleyan at Hotmail.com. But until next week, God bless.